the collab. There we go. So let's get started with introductions. I'm Dr. Tahita Bronner your naturopathic doctor. I'm the founder and CEO of Goodness for Life Center. I have 40 years of experience in healthcare. I started my career as a registered nurse and I received my Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from Westchester University in 1980. And most recently I obtained my doctorate in naturopathic medicine from the University of Bridgeport Connecticut in 2013. I'm currently licensed by the State Board of Physicians in Maryland. So feel free to go to my website at drbronnernd.org to schedule an online appointment for a telehealth visit um, anytime Monday through Friday, 9 to 3 um, p.m. So, and as part of our community outreach at Goodness for Life Center, we created our Facebook group back in February. We're honored to have over 730 members now and still growing. So if you haven't joined our group already, please feel free to join and invite other women like yourselves who are interested in living a healthier lifestyle. Uh, we share information that we hope is helpful to you on a daily basis. And we meet the first Saturday typically of every month to talk about different health topics. So um, you want to put yourselves on mute and have your cameras off. And um, Will, today we're talking about healthy aging and senior care. I'm happy to have a co-presenter with me today. Her name is Arifa. Arifa, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, ma'am. And thank you, Dr. Tahita. Um, peace and blessings to each and every one of you. Just a little bit about myself. I am Aretha Hassan. I have worked as a licensed practical nurse since the age of 25. And I have worked in the state of Virginia, uh, Massachusetts, California, and Georgia. So you can see I've worked all four corners of the United States. I have earned a bachelor's degree uh, from UMass, Boston and I have a major in geriatrics. I am a member of the Red Hat Society and I am a member of the Georgia Gerontology Society. I have worked in numerous settings, uh, which include hospitals, mental health care facilities, medical private practices, correctional facilities, but my favorite has been nursing homes and convalescent homes. I have worked in these type of settings, the nursing homes and convalescent homes for over 25 plus years. Um, as far back as I can remember, I have always gravitated to the elderly population uh, ever since I was a child. So when I was in nursing school, out of approximately 50 students, I was the only one who said I uh, wanted to work with uh, geriatrics. And everybody looked at me like, hmm. But nonetheless, I found joy, I found pleasure, and I found a lot of appreciation from that uh, group. Now, uh, recently I did get my feet wet. I worked in home health care, um, and I found that to be quite inviting and educational for me because I had never did that type of work before, but it was an eye opener. I really enjoyed it. It was more uh, of a one on one with the clients and I got an opportunity to get to know them well and get to know them better. And likewise, they got to know me. I became like their routine uh, nurse. And um, the only thing I didn't like was that commute. I hated that travel back and forth, you know, traffic. It was just horrific sometimes. Recently, I celebrated my 73rd birthday, and I am happy to announce, according to the National Institute of Health, I'm placed in a category that is referred to as early elderly. So enough about me. I want to talk to you later about health and wellness as it relates to our seniors and our elderly population. So stay tuned and thank you. Thank you, Aretha. Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, let's see. Okay. So um, I guess that places me then in the category of senior because I just turned 63 in August. And many of my clients are seniors like myself in ranging from seniors to elderly seniors. So I'm blessed and humbled to say that my mom lives with me and she's a healthy, independent, 87 year old elderly senior. Really? And I wanna be just like her when I grow up. Nice. <laughs> So let's get started. Um, our learning objectives for today are to discuss longevity and what it means to age gracefully. We'll talk about nutrition that helps promote healthy aging, optimizes bone health and supports the immune system. We'll discuss the importance of exercise for seniors. And then Arifa will talk about senior safety, managing meal times, the importance of socialization and medication management, okay? So what does aging gracefully mean? So I love this quote, do not regret growing older as it is a privilege that is denied to many, which is so true because no matter what age you are right now, you can think about all the people whom you've lost along the way, some that have never um, made it to be an adult, uh, a senior or an elderly senior like many of us. So it's um, each year is uh, special, each day is precious, and each moment is gracious as we shall only live it once. Be comfortable with growing older, knowing that each of us is still here to fulfill God's divine purpose for our lives, to use each day to keep evolving, keep growing, keep becoming wiser and developing into who we really are and doing what we are destined to do. So aging gracefully isn't just about looking younger. It's about living your best life and having the spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, and financial health to enjoy it. All of those things need to be balanced. So we can get better with age with the right self-love, self-discipline, and self-care starting right now at whatever age we are. It's never too late to improve your health and your lifestyle. Aging gracefully is more about being healthy than keeping the wrinkles in your neck and your face away even though it's hard to look at sometimes, right? So, but the best way to keep your body young is to live a healthy, well-rounded lifestyle. And you've heard it at nauseam all your life, right? To eat right, eat a clean diet, to sleep well, to exercise. Well, those are just simple, essential pillars of health that may not keep you looking you know, and feeling like you felt at 25, but it will help slow down the bodily aging process as much as can be reasonably expected. So when it comes to healthy aging and longevity, I choose healthcare over sick care. Which one do you choose? You can choose to live a healthier lifestyle by eating the proper foods that promote health versus sitting around, living a sedentary lifestyle, eating all the wrong foods like overly processed foods and junk foods that are high in salt and sugar that you know are no good for you, but think it's okay because of all the medications that you take on the sick care side that treats all those diseases that are caused by unhealthy living, like diabetes type two, hypertension, heart disease, cancer, diseases that are preventable and reversible. So it's my job as a naturopathic doctor to help you choose health care over sick care by helping you live your healthiest lifestyle. So let's talk about uh, holistic health for seniors. It's an approach to life 
that emphasizes the connection between your spirit, your mind, your body, having the goal of functioning and being balanced to achieve maximum well being. So, a key component to uh, a holistic approach is taking responsibility for your own well being and making everyday choices that put you in charge of your own health. It's less about illness and symptoms and more about integrating healthy practices into the fabric of your everyday life. So this kind of approach can be the key to longevity as well as maintaining independence and overall wellness as you age. All right, so it's important to optimize bone health as we age to prevent osteoporosis, which is common as we grow older. The hormone estrogen helps to make and rebuild our bones. So as we get older, you know, after menopause, our estrogen levels drop and it can speed up bone loss. So that's why osteoporosis is most common among older women. So to prevent osteoporosis, we wanna choose a diet that cons consists primarily of fruits and vegetables and grains and, and non-fat dairy products if you eat dairy. Um, you, research has shown that vegetarians tend to have a lower incidence of osteoporosis than meat eaters. Okay, because a vegetarian diet is high in calcium and potassium, and it's low, it, lower in phosphorus and in protein um, than a meat-based diet. And that helps to aid in the prevention of osteoporosis. So dairy milk is not the only source of calcium. We should eat more foods on this list that are naturally high in calcium. And these are just have the highest uh, amounts of calcium. Now, it's uncertain whether calcium supplementation uh, reduces bone loss after menopause. So um, we should have our calcium levels checked to make sure that our calcium levels aren't low. And we should avoid alcohol because alcohol decreases intestinal calcium absorption and vitamin D levels. Also, foods that are high in fat, um, salt, sugar, Smoking, of course, um, all of these things that we know we should not be doing will also um, uh, decrease calcium absorption in the body as well. So you may need to take a calcium supplement. I can help you with that as well as vitamin D3, uh, which will help to um, uh, with calcium absorption. Now, when it comes to exercise, um, as seniors, we often don't get the right of amount of daily exercise. So you can type in the chat if you want, whether you're getting enough exercise, whether you're uh, exercising at least three times a week, and that's just minimum. You can type in the chat whether you're doing that or not. If you are, very good. And, and stars to you because it's so important because as seniors, we often don't get the right amount of exercise. And based on everything that we know, there's no substitute. There's no shortcuts for exercise. When it comes to delaying the age process, it can't be done by medication. It just can't. There's no substitute for exercise. So exercising on a consistent basis is important for everyone. Even in our retirement years, um, everyone should be encouraged to exercise regularly. We have to find an exercise program or activity that we enjoy doing and find a way to incorporate it into our daily routine at least three times a week. So here's some reasons why as seniors, it's so important for us to get moving. It increases balance, and Arif is going to talk about the um, uh, safety for seniors, but falls uh, is the number one, is one of the number one injuries. So improving your balance and stability will lead to decreased fall risk for
for seniors. It builds endurance. The more you exercise, the better at it you become. So your exercise will build up your endurance, allowing you to become stronger and healthier. It also improves life expectancy. People who live to be centurions, they have exercise incorporated into their routines on a, on a regular basis. So it helps also to keep your mind and your body helpful. Uh, it equals longer life expectancy. It lowers because it lowers the risk of major diseases like heart attacks, diabetes, and cancer, right? It decreases depression. When you exercise, your body releases endorphins. Endorphins help to alleviate the feelings of depression and anxiety. I always feel better after I exercise. Um, so, but depression and anxiety is a common problem amongst seniors and reduces the risk of heart attacks. So heart issues are a major concern. So, and it's due to issues such as poor diet, obesity, family history, and smoking. So regular exercise has been shown to reduce that risk and it because it helps increase the blood flow to your heart and it makes your heart pump harder and stronger. So that is the, uh, a way to reduce, reduce heart attacks, right? Now, a lot of us as seniors, we live in chronic pain every day and it can be excruciating and it can decrease our quality of life. So prescription pain medication can be provided like in most cases, uh, prescription pain medication is prescribed. Um, however, it's not for everybody. There are several alternative treatments for you and your senior loved ones that help reduce chronic pain. Walking is one, if you can walk, um, just the simple act of walking helps to reduce pain and promotes mental health. It lowers blood sugar. So um, it can help really reduce that chronic pain um, by strengthening your joints and your muscles. Uh, body weight training, um, just having some simple body weights because when we get older, we have muscle loss. So to help prevent muscle loss, doing um, uh, some weights is, is healthy even if you're sitting in a chair Doing, uh, doing light weights or chair squats or, or climbing the stairs. It's one way to help prevent muscle loss. And then swimming. Swimming is um, will get all of your muscles in your body and your joints moving and it's gentle on them. So it eases and it supports the muscles and joints of the body and it's softer and it's slower and it helps the body heal at a steadier rate because your, um, your, your um, joints are little, literally have no impact uh, of gravity of, of hitting the floor. So uh, it's very, very, very healthy way to get exercise. And if you notice, lots of facilities have swimming pools and, um, and seniors love it. It's a way to really get some exercise in, as well as yoga, Pilates. Uh, yoga has been found to improve a person's overall mood as well as improve your balance and strengthen your muscle tone. Meditation is also um, activates the part of the brain that processes pain. So meditation has been shown to help reduce pain intensity and decrease stress. And when you decrease stress, you also decrease pain. Acupuncture is also good, has incredible benefits for treating um, arthritis pain, for example, migraines, uh, all kinds of emotional and mental ailment, ailments can be, um, uh, uh, acupuncture can help with. Uh, so if you haven't tried that, it's a very good thing to try, as well as aromatherapy, which helps to uh, an alternative way to reduce chronic pain like migraines and muscles and bone pains as well. There's lots of essential oils 
like rosemary and things like that, lavender that you can use. Um, and then there's just a natural path. What I do is, you know, help to uh, prescribe a, a diet um, exercise plan for you that is going to promote self-healing, um, you know, spending time in the sun, taking your vitamins, eating more vegetables, uh, just everything that uh, helps you to be well-rounded and grounded uh, in your everyday holistic lifestyle. And um, so alternative treatments, uh, there's a wide range of it, and it's a natural and simple way to reduce pain over using prescription pain medication. And then when you do exercise, you want to make sure that you're doing it safely. You wanna create goals that help you stay motivated. You wanna start off slowly. You don't wanna overexert yourself, do too much. If you need to just start with five minutes of light cardio, just two times a week, you know, just get started, just do something. Uh, any exercise is better than no exercise, okay? <laughs> All right, so um, what does holistic immune health for seniors mean? Well, as we age, uh, just as you probably can't run in your 20s, your immune system doesn't work as well as it used to either. So as we get older, you've heard of the term immunocompromised. Um, we, you know, our immune systems tend to get weaker. So, but there's lots of things that we can do to boost our immune system using a natural holistic approach. We can eat plant-based foods that because they build up macrophages that engulf and destroy viruses and bacteria or any kind of invader in the body. Um, maintaining a healthy weight by avoiding sugar and processed carbs because sugar and carbs weaken the immune system's ability to attack. So, and staying hydrated is also important to eliminate toxins and other bacteria. Exercising regularly, as we just talked about, just having, releasing those endorphins, the chemicals in the brain that act as natural painkillers, they also help to improve sleep, which in turn helps to reduce stress. Stress is number one. It's, we experience stress so through so many, you know, on a daily basis. And so it's important to do all of these things to keep stress at a minimum and especially getting enough rest. We have to be able to listen to our bodies because our bodies will tell us when we're overdoing it, all right? And then um, nutrition for immune health is also important that you're eating the right foods that contain the right nutrients. So if we just focus on the four basic a with carotenoids, B, the stress vitamin C with flavonoids, vitamin D3 and zinc, those four will pretty much support and boost your immune system in a way that uh, will be optimal for immune health, where you don't need to do anything else, but um, make sure that you're getting these nutrients in your body along with exercising and doing all the essential pillars to help. So what's vitamin A? Um, we'll go through it real quickly. Uh, these are contained in your orange, sweet potato, butternut squash, carrot, spinach, dry. So these are your colorful um, fruits and vegetables. And they have a really rich source of vitamin A and carotenoids that should be included in your diet. And then there are supplements that you can take as well. Then you have the vitamin B, which are the stress vitamins. There's like eight different classes of vitamin B, all right? Um, and it has so many different benefits, but the main one that we wanna talk about for immune health is it helps to calm the nervous system and helps to uh, avoid um, uh, free radical damage that um, is caused in the body. So um, it helps to uh, boost the immune system and also it's great for your skin as well, all right? And then vitamin C with flavonoids is really supports your immune function by replicating the way it's found in nature. So vitamin C, which is absorbic acid is a key antioxidant 
that helps prevent cells throughout the body from free radical damage as well. And it helps produce cellular energy and essential proper metabolism. Now you can get vitamin C, not just in an orange, but in a bell pepper, a red medium bell pepper by itself has 152 milligrams of vitamin C. Mm. So there's lots of different sources that you can see here in the amount, strawberries, broccoli. Oh my goodness, there's so much, you know, we can uh, get from just eating right. And then there's dietary sources of vitamin D for those of us who can't get out in the sun the way we should. Um, cod liver oil, trout, salmon are very high sources of dietary uh, dietary vitamin C and then uh, vitamin D. And then we also get it from the sun. If we get out in the sun, we absorb the UV rays from the sun through the skin, and then. It's processed in the liver and then it's uh, uh, and then to the kidneys to it to turn it into an active form that the body can use. So it has to go through this process. It goes through the skin, through the liver, through the kidneys, and now it's in a usable form. All right. And then zinc. Last but not least, uh, these are good food sources of zinc. But you can also take zinc as a supplement. Oh, if you're taking vitamin uh, D as a supplement, you can take anywhere between two to 5,000 IUs, um, you know, just uh, to take, but your optimal range should be between 51 and 70. If you get your vitamin D level checked, you'll find that most of us aren't anywhere near 51 to 70. Most of us are in a range of in the 20s to 30s. So, um, you know, it's always pretty safe to say um, we all need the vitamin D supplementation, but the zinc is also essential for your immune system. It has many other functions. It's involved in like 200 um, en enzymatic reactions in the body. So it, you know, it, it has, a lot of function and, uh, but it's great for immune health as well, right? So what about herbs? Um, you know, ginger root, turmeric, honey, garlic, onions, astragalus, your Chinese medicines are like uh, ashwagandha are great uh, for um, immune health. Uh, elderberry, wild oregano oil. These are some staple things that are in your kitchen or that you can order. Um, I can help you with herbal supplements as well. So um, all of these are great for immune health and um, garlic and onions, there's just no replacement for that. So if you, if the minute you start feeling sick, if you make a garlic onion soup, um, it's just a, an overnight cure. <laughs> it warms your, your, your uh, lungs and it's just wonderful for uh, pneumonia, for flu, for uh, any kind of virus uh, or bacteria. Now, what about mushrooms? I'm going to kind of speed up a little. Um, so many of us uh, uh, worry about our memory and, and our thinking ability as we get older. Um, but it's Mind, you know, for, forgetfulness is a normal part of aging, but not serious mental problems. But we'll talk about that. But scientific studies show that lion's mane, reishi, and chaga mushrooms are the three most effective medicinal mushrooms for brain health. And they help the brain from neurodegeneration, from um, it helps to boost your cognitive function. And some people who take it swear by it and it helps to support uh, Alzheimer's and dementia as well. So you might take these in combination. Um, when I recommend these, I'll recommend it in a combination type supplement. Um, there's also mataki and um, shiitake mushrooms that you can eat and cook with. Uh, there's lots of wonderful recipes to cook with mushrooms. They're very, very healthy for your immune system as well as memory function, all right? Now, what's the difference between normal aging and Alzheimer's just really quickly, um, you know, don't think that you have Alzheimer's if you're just making a bad decision once in a while that goes 
normal aging or if you miss a monthly payment or forget what day it is, which I often do. I have a clock with the date and a real, it's a wonderful clock. It has the day, the, the time, the, the month and, and the year and everything. But if I forgot the year, then I, I think I'd be in trouble. But if, if, I, if you're losing track of the date and, or the time of the year, then, then that's, that's uh, beginning Alzheimer's. But just forgetting sometimes which word to use uh, or having um, versus having trouble having a conversation is different or losing things from time to time. I use my, I lose my phone all the time. I have to call my phone to find where it is. It's, that's just the worst thing for me that makes me think that I, I'm getting all the time. <laughs> so, um, but if I'm misplacing things often and just not able to find them, then that's different. So, so you wanna be, when it comes to seniors, you wanna know the difference between what's normal and what's not. There are scientifically based, um, um, neurogenerative, um, uh, neurodegenerative um, treatments uh, for Alzheimer's disease like ginkgo and hypericum and ginseng. But if you're taking lots of other medications, then it's something that you definitely want to um, look at any um, uh, drug reactions, and which Arif is going to be talking about in just a moment. But um, there are some medicinal plants that are used for the treatment of Alzheimer's. All right. So that is it for me. And I'm going to turn it over to Arifa to take us through the rest of the presentation. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And Arifa, it's yours. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tahita. Well, my discussion um, today is basically centered around our seniors and or elderly. Um, the term senior citizen, sometimes, you know, some people get a little frightened, but I, I welcomed it uh, when I was a senior citizen because I was thinking about retirement. Uh, the term senior citizen typically refers to someone who is retired and above the age of 60 or 65. Typically 65 to 74 years old, you are considered early elderly. That's where I am. While 75 years and older, you are considered as late elderly. So based on uh, the information, I found it to be quite interesting. I do realize, however, that some of the people in this category can be a little sometimes difficult, um, sometimes difficult and challenging to deal with. And sometimes it's because of their ways, the way that they were brought up, the things that have influenced them throughout their life. And sometimes it's due to their way of thinking. Also, it can be due to a medical diagnosis. Um, Dr. Tahita did mention briefly Alzheimer's and dementia, whether it's early or late dementia, um, can affect our loved one's behavior. However, we are all aging each and every day, each and every year. I wasn't always 73. And you weren't always 24. But if we are all blessed to continue to live, then eventually we will all eventually fit in one of the categories as it relates to aging. So with that said, there were some things I had in mind that was of concern. And so I decided to formulate a question to try to get a survey opinion on it. And the question was, what are some of the most common problems and concerns regarding older adults? So this particular survey question was generated by myself and I presented it um, for some ideas and our feedback from our African-American community who are also referred to today as Afro-descendants. I wanted to know what 
were some of the main concerns related to the health and wellness regarding our aging and older adults. The survey response was taken from family, family members who are providing care for their loved ones, people in general, and myself based on my own experiences. And the survey revealed basically the same thing, the same concerns, mostly the majority rule that their concerns were centered around safety, nutrition, social skills, and medications. These are the main concerns that stood out the most during the survey. And each one of these are very, very important and carries a lot of weight. So with that said, I'd like to share as much information as I can with you regarding these survey uh, concerns. And one is safety, one is nutrition, one is social skills, and then the other one would be medication tips. So I'll start with safety. Safety is very important to us all, and especially to our seniors and elders. According to the CDC, every year, one out of every four elderly people fall, and approximately 36 million ends up in the hospital. And of that, approximately 32,000 die. Older adults can be affected by many things. Decreased vision, decreased hearing, smell, cognition, and mobility, which makes their safety very important. Now, these changes that I just mentioned, they happen gradually. So it's like it sneaks up on on you, sneaks up on the elderly. And because of that, they may not realize that they have significant issues that can affect them as well as their safety. So let's try to provide a safe home, keeping mobility in mind. There are several things that we can do to enhance or provide a safe environment for our elderly as well as our safety. One, we can make sure that the hallways, stairs, and all walking paths are well lit. I find that to be, even, even my own self, sometimes I'm, I'm so busy going here and going there at night, and I forget I put a shoe here or whatever, and you know, you can trip over things. So you want to make sure that all walking paths are well lit and clear, that all the areas are visible that you can actually see, especially when you're doing night walking. Make sure that there's no clutter uh, in those areas, things like books or shoes. Uh, number two, we can encourage the use of rails and banisters when going up and down the stairs. Uh, you might want to add supportive grabs and these supportive grab bars, you wanna put them anywhere you think your loved one may need them because this will increase uh, safety. And a good example would be either in the shower or in the tub. I've seen them there and uh, I put some in the tub for my own self. Okay. Uh, another thing you want to think about is the scatter rugs. They should never be placed at the top or the foot, the top of the stairs or the bottom of the stairs because these scattered rugs along with area rugs can be very slippery. You want to try to take these rugs down to make sure they don't move and slip and slide. I have actually walked across some rugs where you could lose your balance and, and fall in and injure yourself. So you want to make sure that you have that in place. Also, anti-slip mats are good. You can place them around the sink and or the shower. And also installing, and I like this one, I don't have it at my home, but I have tested it before, installing an elevated toilet seat that can help the seniors uh, and the elders to get up and down more easily. Uh, some of the uh, bathroom uh, toilet seats are so low, you have to almost pull yourself up from the wall or somewhere to try to get up. But these seats are so high 
uh, built and very comfortable and very soft. So I personally, um, I personally liked it. So going forward, I'm just gonna um, offer you a little brief checklist. And this is basically geared towards seniors or elderly who actually do live alone. We can in consider installing a medical alert system, uh, a fall monitoring system device. And I know you've seen those advertised here in their different places. Uh, you can install an effective home security system. Uh, that's a good one. And you can install railings and slip proof mats. Uh, just remove uh, tripping hazards and install good, good lighting. Uh, in different places of your home. Last but not least, we can all do this. We can check on our loved ones each and every day if need be to make sure that they are safe and well. So those are some things that was of concern as it relates to the survey regarding safety. And the other one was of concern was nutrition. So we all know that proper nutrition is critical for the overall health and wellness. Nutrition is the first line of defense against infection and diseases. It can also prevent injury. A senior's quality of life is directly tied to being well nourished and remaining active as long as possible. Now, Dr. Tahita has already shared some good tips as it relates to different types of nutrients and herbs and things that can be used to enhance nutrient intake. But what can we do when our seniors lose their appetite? Because sometimes they do, and it's for reasons, different reasons. And we may not know what all the reasons are, but there are certain reasons that we can actually rule out. The first thing, we want to do, we want to rule out any serious health conditions. If they have any kind of serious health conditions, you know, Parkinson's, dementia, you know, uh, Alzheimer's or thyroid problems and stuff like that, those are health conditions. They may not have the appetite that we would anticipate. Or if there are certain medications that renders really bad side effects that causes them to be just wiped out, lethargic and tired and sleepy and listless and don't want to eat. Well, that's something we need to take a look at. We need to investigate those medications uh, and investigate those possible side effects. And then the other thing is dental problems, okay? So if you've got a toothache, who wants to eat with a toothache? Or if you got chipped teeth, or if you got some type of uh, gum diseases, or if you have loose fitting dentures, you know, all these things can be corrected. So uh, we wanna make sure that those three things are basically ruled out. And once they have been ruled out, then now you have an opportunity to experiment with other ways to entice our elderly to get them to eat more. So I wanna say that, like I said, it's a challenge, but don't become discouraged if on your first try, or even your 15th attempt, you, it doesn't work. Just keep trying and eventually you will find a way to encourage the older adult to eat a little more. Uh, I can remember, uh, real brief, I, when I worked in a nursing home, a lot of times uh, senior citizens, they would not sleep all night. Many of them would be you know, restless or they would put their light on, they would complain that, they hadn't eaten anything all day long, hadn't eaten none in days and 24 hours. And I would feed them. You know, I knew they had eaten, but I would feed them and I would feed them sandwiches, cookies, crackers, milk, and have them sitting up in the foyer watching TV. And next thing you know, you look over, they're out, they're gone to sleep. So that's what I would do rather than medicate them, I fed them. So the other thing that uh, could cause them to lose their appetite is some of the medications have side effects and some of these side effects from the medicines can cause their mouths to be dry. Uh, so before meals, you could ask the older adult to chew on some sugarless gum maybe, brush their teeth or use oral rinse. 
And what that does, it stimulates the saliva flowing and it reduces the discomfort and improves their ability to taste, um, which can make them more willing to eat. So that is uh, something we can keep in mind and try to stimulate the saliva glands to get them to eat. You can get rid of strange taste that's caused by uh, medication side effects. Some drugs have a real bad taste, you know, depending on what it is. And it has leave a strange kind of taste um, in the mouth. And this affects the taste of the food uh, sometimes when our loved ones eat. If it's meat, it may taste a little strange or metallic. Uh, you want to serve some different sources of protein, maybe some beans or dairy. You could use plastic fork and or knives. If metal silverware, if that makes the taste worse, you can improvise with that, the plastic um, utensils. If water tastes funny, I'm, I'm one. I used to hate drinking water. It just didn't appeal to me, colorless, odorless, tasteless. So, But eventually I did have to drink water. So with that said, if the water tastes funny, you can always add a little mint. You can add sliced fruit, some lemon or cucumber. And you could also try, and this is what I did, flavored water enhancers. And that seemed to work. You know, they have all different types of flavors and you can pick and choose which one you like. Another big one is make meal time a pleasant experience. You know, some people, they do respond to, and they respond well to a nice setting and good company for dinner. We can set the table. We can put candles on the table. You can have soft music on in the background. And this is a good introduction to stimulating eat times, eating alone, and eating all alone all the time can be very lonely and depressing. So we should try to find time to just sit and eat with the older adult. You know, um, they weren't always old, older, aging. They were sitting at the table with us when we were children, many of them. So now let's sit at the table with them, find the time to sit at the table with the older adult and maybe chat about pleasant topics during the meal. The other thing is you wanna offer some choices of control. You know, when you don't have no control of anything or say so, then, um, you know, you may not wanna eat. You may not have even the appetite or the care to eat. So when someone is ill or frail, they do lose their independence and refusing to eat sometime can make them feel like they've gained some control or regained some control over themselves and their life and their life. So you want to give back to the old adults some of that control, allowing them to make some choices uh, when there's different types of food and involving meal planning, allow them to be a part of meal planning. Because when you allow someone to participate in something that's gonna benefit and or affect them, then they're more apt to maybe eat. And then another thing we wanna do, we wanna serve water between meals. Try and limit the fluids during meal times because a lot of times what happens, they'll fill up on the liquids and then they, they're no longer hungry. So then we won't be able to get the food in them. We know that dehydration can suppress the appetite. So it's important to keep the older adult well hydrated. And like I said, some liquids are needed because it does help moisten uh, and encourage swallowing the food better and safely. And serving a lot of water during meals though can fill up the senior and then the food goes, you know, goes out the window. So we want to balance things. We want to get to know them, get to know their routine, get to know the pros and cons with them. And we want to experiment and balance things by which we are going to be successful in getting them to do those things that will help protect them. Uh, you want to try to keep the majority of the beverages. You want to try to keep that as a post-meal relaxation. 
And then you want to encourage them to drink water between meals as a healthy habit because a lot of elderly people do become dehydrated because they don't get enough fluids uh, in their system. Sometimes we used to go around and pinch their skin, like just not hard now, but gently pinch their skin. And if it doesn't spring back and it was just standing up like that, we knew that they were becoming dehydrated and that's not good. So you wanna make sure that they get enough fluids uh, in them. And um, sometimes you might wanna consider making the dishes, the flavors a little bit stronger. And that's because we have taste board, taste buds surrounding our sensory organ, which is our tongue. And those taste buds are sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. So those are four taste buds that surround our tongue. However, the taste buds begin to decrease with age and the rest of them begin to shrink. So it began to lose its vital operation, the taste bud. So after say about the age of 60, you may begin to lose the ability to, to distinguish the taste of sweet, salty, sour, and bitter foods. Taste buds often become less sensitive as we age. So with that said, bland foods certainly won't help stimulate their appetite. So what do we do? We try to enhance the food. We use herbs like Dr. Tahita was speaking about the herbs and the different spices uh, to enhance the flavors. And also you can use seasonings, but you don't wanna use seasonings that's gonna increase uh, your blood pressure that you don't wanna do. We can experiment with food in the different types of temperature. Some people change their preferences as they get older. Um, some things you used to like when you were younger, you don't like it anymore, or you don't care for it that much anymore. So some people like hot food, some people like warm, some like cold meals. Uh, you just have to see which temperature they like best. And by all means, take advantage of all of the hungry moments because they don't necessarily eat every time the table is set. They may not eat breakfast or they may eat lunch. They may not eat lunch and they may not eat breakfast, but they may eat supper or they may eat all of them in three or four o'clock in the morning, the light comes on down the hall and they still hungry, but do feed them. Um, and if they, if they care for seconds, give them seconds. You know, you can portion out the food in small portions, but if they say they're hungry, just feed, feed them, please. It doesn't matter what time it is, just take advantage of the hunger moments to get a few more calories and nutrients in our loved one's body and we can balance that. So the other concern that the survey yield was the social skills. This one is a biggie, um, especially today in my mind, because I think of the COVID, you know, COVID has caused a lot of people to be um, isolated. And in isolation, other things can creep in. Okay, and when I say other things, I'm talking about things like depression and or loneliness. Social isolation is one of the leading causes of depression in seniors. Loneliness can easily take a toll on individuals of any age, not just seniors, but any age, but it can cause a greater concern for older adults as their routine and independence change. You know, they used to go to work, they used to be around their friends, they used to eat at a certain time and they go on lunch break every day. Those things have now changed, all right? So socialization can have a positive effect where, so, where isolation is concerned by helping the seniors to feel loved and needed. Just because they are up in age, they still, need love and still need to be needed and feel appreciated. So with that said, what exactly are social skills? Social skills are the tools that enables people to communicate, to learn, 
to ask for help, to get their needs met in appropriate ways, to get along with others, to make friends, to develop healthy relationships, protect themselves and in general, and be able to interact in society in a harmonious manner. So that's a huge list of things that social uh, skills defines. Social needs of older people are very diverse. They seem to focus on both the intimate and the peripheral members in their network. The feeling of connectiveness to others and to a community of neighbor and neighborhoods contributes to their well being as having a feeling of independence. So when I think of COVID, I think a lot of that has been zapped. You know, um, it's unfortunate, but there's other ways too that our elder and senior citizen and senior age population can get around that. Why? maintain an active social life as we get older. Staying social can do a lot of things. It can reduce the risk of developing depression and mental illness. Social activity can benefit cognitive function, your thinking. An active social life can slow down health decline. Being social can improve your physical fitness, Dr. Kahita sure spoke on that. It does a lot of things, staying physically active. And social interaction can reduce stress, lower your blood pressure. Why? Because being around people whose company you enjoy helps to lower stress, which can lower your blood pressure and reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. People who socialize with others tend to live longer than those who are more isolated. Social engagement is associated with a stronger immune system, especially in older adults. It also benefits the overall health and enables individuals to fight off colds. You know, winter's right around the corner. It also helps to fight off flu and other types of cancers. There are several opportunities to boost social skills. Now, why would I say that and how do I know? There are senior and elder daycare centers which offer lots of things to do because I participated in those senior daycare centers. Uh, some of the things that they offered there was just horrific. It was so nice. They were entertainment offered, music, food, games, computer classes, art and crafts, dancing, and sometimes they even uh, had trips. They would go on different types of trips. Uh, when I participated in the, uh, the, if you want to call it the daycare center, when I went there, I took some computer classes and there were quite a few people in my class and we got to know one another and I had fun. And also I decided to take a class in Spanish. They were teaching a foreign language, you know, primary, uh, just the basic, but I did take a class in Spanish and I found it quite uh, informational and I enjoyed that. Now, some of the senior high rises, they offer the same thing to some degree, not all of the things that the daycare center offers, but they offer a lot of the things because you have a lot of people who live in these uh, senior high rises and how do I know? Because I lived in the senior high rise. So I did participate in the movie night, uh, game nights, you know, they had fun, they had snacks and we just had a good time, uh, myself and my peers. So it's important, our social skills to keep them and keep them maintained because it is things like this that enhances our health enhances your loved one health and offers a sense of belonging to help the individual to keep them moving along. So I think that once this COVID maybe dissipates, um, there will be more activities available to our seniors, 
But in the meantime, there are some seniors who have taken matters in their own hand. They have created all kinds of uh, links on the computers. They have Zoom, uh, all kinds of um, things that they have chimed in and made themselves familiar with. So a lot of times they are not just sitting in the house or sitting in the cubicle as some people call it. They're on their computers talking to people and they're having fun. And, you know, some of them love to read, you know, uh, play solitary. There's a lot of things that some of our seniors have become a little bit more savvy and about doing. And I'm happy about that. I really am. Uh, when I stayed in the senior citizen high rise, I used to try to knock on the doors and get some of the uh, citizens to come out of those rooms and, 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 you know, get involved. And that was a challenge, but it worked for some, but not for all. Moving right along, the last uh, survey question revealed was the concern of medications. So I do have a few tips for you as it relates to medication, as it relates to medication adherence in our seniors and our elderly. So approximately 55%, based on the Department of Human Services, about 55% of the elderly are non-compliant with their prescription drug orders. In other words, they don't take their medications as prescribed by the doctor. And um, I have been kind of guilty of that in the past, but um, you should take your medicine unless there's some type of adverse reaction, or if it's something that doesn't sit right with you, uh, while you're taking your medicine, you can pretty much gauge yourself. You was feeling a certain kind of way all your life. You know how you feel. And then when you start taking certain medications, all of a sudden there might be a shift. So that's when you need to call the doctor or that's when you need to call your pharmacist and find out what some of those uh, side effects are. But um, that's what they said. 55% of elderly people are non-compliant. Now medications, depending on what they are taken for can be crucial for improved health, or it can cause a major health setback if not taken properly. When doses are skipped or too much medication is taken, the result can be dangerous or even deadly. Each year, about 350,000 people are hospitalized because of adverse drug events according to the CDC and prevention. Older adults often take multiple, you know, different types of medications, vitamin supplements and um, other medicines to treat different types of symptoms and conditions. So this increases the number of pills they're taking. Um, this can increase opportunity for a medication mix-up. Um, in some cases, it can be very dangerous. So if you're taking five pills or more, it's usually referred to as a polypharmacy. Five pills or more are referred to as a polypharmacy. And that seemed to be a growing number in America because as the population ages and move forward, and by the way, they are expecting over 100 million elderly people by the year of 2060. That is a lot of elderly people. So they're trying to put steps in place uh, now. And also we can put steps in place to help our loved ones to become more organized and practice medica better medication management. So there's some effective management tips I can give you for the seniors as well as for yourself. You wanna review your aging loved one's medication with their doctor. So when we go to the doctor, I know sometimes the doctor might be in a hurry, his right prescription, tell you you need to take this, but wait a minute. I want to sit down and I want to get a clarification on this medication that you're writing out for me to take. I want to know what is it supposed to do. And I want to review the medication with the doctor, with my loved one. You can ask questions and read the medication label. You know, nobody's perfect. Sometimes they make mistakes at the pharmacy. I mean, you may think that's your medicine and it could be somebody else's medicine. So know exactly what type of medicine you're supposed to get 
Make sure you read the label and read it before you leave the pharmacy, okay? Just to make sure you can take the top off and look at the pills and make sure they're the right ones and have an idea of what some of those potential side effects might be, okay? Like I said, I was taking some medicine years ago that I had never taken before. And all of a sudden it was affecting me and I had to let it go because I had never felt like that before. So I knew immediately it was the medicine. So you can ask if the dosage of medicine that the doctor is prescribing for your loved one is age appropriate. Now, uh, some things are not age appropriate for elderly people. It's like, don't know one size fit all. Uh, whereas you might've been active uh, when you was in your forties or fifties and you was doing things and you was taking this medication and it was doing what it was supposed to do. But now that we've gotten older, our bodies have slowed down. The metabolism of medication is not always broken down effectively like it used to be years ago in our body. So some of that medication just keeps lingering around. And then we just take another one on top of the other one that's already lingering around. So you have to make sure that the medications and the dosage is age appropriate. Um, you want to make your loved one aware of possible dangers of self-prescribing. You know, we, some of us, maybe me, are good for prescribing um, things for ourselves. You know, when we go to the store, we pick up this or we pick up that and we have a medicine cabinet full of stuff that we have bought over the counter, but it doesn't always mean that it's good for us. You really have to know your body. You have to know your system. And you also have to know what are some of your allergies, you know, because there's things that they put in medicines today that we may be allergic to, and we may not know that until it's in our system and affects us in some kind of way. So I would test things just a little bit, just to make sure that if I'm going to take it, that I don't have a bad um, allergic reaction to it. And you can also minimize the number of doctors that you visit and pharmacists that you visit. You know, some people have more than one doctor. They may have a doctor over here for this and they have another doctor over there for that. They got a doctor over yonder for this. So when you have more than one doctor, a primary care doctor and more than one pharmacist, uh, it would be a good idea to at least put them all in contact with one another. And the reason why you would wanna consider thinking about doing this is because you wouldn't want one doctor writing a prescription that another doctor has already written or a doctor is writing a prescription that is similar to the medicine that you're already taking. So it's so important to make sure that they're all on the same page with you and what you're taking why you're taking it, et cetera. So just try to minimize the number of doctors that you have if you can, but if not, try to get them all on the same page. And last but not least, the other thing that we can do to help our loved ones, I know I did it when I did home health care, is to help them organize their medications, um, especially if they're taking polypharmacy, five or more, and they're taking it more than once a day, then we should take the time to sit down. First and foremost, I would say, write down the name of the, all the medications. And then you can, um, once you put the name on them, then you can have like a little diagram of the color because some pills are yellow, some are blue, some are red. And then you would write the name of the pill. You would put possible side effects and then you would put the dosage amount and what time are they supposed to take it? In the morning, in the evening, at night, or do they take it three times a day? So that's where the little pill box would uh, come in. And also you wanna make sure that you monitor them for medication compliance. Uh, sometimes our seniors do forget to take their medication. Sometimes they forget to even take the insulin shots. Uh, sometimes they forget to even do finger sticks, and that goes along with age and their cognitive uh, behavior. So we have to 
be able to assist them when we can and step up to the plate for them to make sure that they're not being taken advantage of, that they're not being misused and or abused because after all, they are our seniors and yes, our loved ones belong to us. So that concludes my presentation um, for today as it relates to the survey questions that I took and I hope uh, it was helpful. If you have any questions, I will try to do my best to answer them. Or if I don't have the answer, I will seek the answer and get it back to you. So at this time, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your time. Thank you.